Welcome to TheStreet.com TV, I'm Greg Greenberg. And today I'm joined by Jeff Hollander. Jeff is the CEO of Hollander Home Fashions, which is one of the oldest and largest pillow manufacturers in the world. One reason why they've been able to stay in business so long is because they've been able to mix Chinese and U.S. production successfully. Jeff's here to explain how they continue to survive and thrive in the tough global environment. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Greg. All right, it's good to have you. You're the third generation CEO. Uh, tell me a little about the history of the company, and then we'll get into the, the manufacturing part. Thanks, Greg. Uh, 1953, my grandfather Bernard started a pillow manufacturer selling to Vornado, which then was trading under two guys. My father joined them a couple years later as a teenager, helped grow the business into this you know, small mom and pop business selling you know, pillows out of a car to a $300 million company that we are today. And, and who, are, who are some of the, uh, the retailers that you supply? Uh, our largest customer is Walmart, where we are successful. I've heard of them. Yeah, we, we're successfully their two-time vendor of the year, so we're very proud of that. We're also very large at Costco, Bloomingdale's, Bed Bath & Beyond, Kohl's, Target, J.C. Penney, Sears, Anna's Linens, and a number of others. Okay, and what's your current mix in terms of manufacturing between offshore manufacturing and domestic manufacturing? Uh, currently, we've got about 1,000 employees in the U.S. and another 1,000 in China. Uh, Generally, what we're doing in China is we're doing a lot of our basic cutting and sewing where we get our fabrics in Asia, we prepare them for filling, and we're able to give fresh fillings, uh, giving the customer the exact product that they want with the U.S. craftsmanship here, but the superior quality of materials that we get in Asia. So obviously a lot of the textile industry is already up and, and gone uh, abroad. Uh, I'm not sure how much we still do in the U.S. down in North Carolina where it used to be uh, one of the, the leading um, areas of, of, of industry. Um, when did you feel the need to go over to China and what do you think about the future of U.S. manufacturing, especially in textiles? We, we first started dealing in China with our feather and down industry, which is where the poultry is grown. We're getting our ducks and geese from China and we learned about that in the 80s. As we were there, we saw that they also had great weaving technology. 1986, they put in immigration control laws in the United States, which stopped the influx of immigrant labor, which is traditionally used in the needle trades. With that, we found that we could get the right labor, the right quality from China, and still maintain certain parts of the industry in the states. How has the recent immigration legislation affected your business? How do you think it's going to affect it for the next 10, 15 years? One of the things that it's led us to see is that manual labor is going to become second jobs here. It's not going to be primary jobs. So what we've learned is we have to de-skill what we're doing in the United States to make it easier and that we've got to take the skilled labor intensive work offshore where we can get people who are interested in those career building jobs. See, I would have thought it was the reverse where the skilled labor stays here and the unskilled is abroad where you can get uh, the wages are lower. As you get into certain industries that's true in the textile, in the needle trade industries, those are not desirable in the United States. It's always been an immigrant workforce going from the early 1900s. Do you foresee production going entirely offshore at some point? I don't. I believe there'll always be a mix in the U.S. because I think we can control what the consumer gets a lot better, giving the actual quality that they, that they desire to have a comfortable night's sleep. Uh, finally, what about unions? We are unionized in both our, our six U.S. locations and in Canada. Uh, we find that the unions have started to understand that they need to help me, to protect me, to get the right things done so I can keep jobs in the United States. So it's no longer a, uh, a confrontational relationship with the unions now. It seems like the unions understand that in order to, to keep the jobs, they need to work with the employers. Uh, that, that's correct. The extent that they used the power to power shift? The, the power hasn't shifted. We're both on the same side as what's happened. We're both trying to save jobs in the United States. The union recognizes that they need to be flexible and allow me to have the right work rules as long as we have the right wages, right conditions, in order to continue in the States and meet what our customers' demands are. Well, it's a very interesting topic, and we're going to watch it. Thanks a lot for being here. It's been Jeff Hollander. I'm Greg Greenberg for TheStreet.com TV. Please come back. Thanks a lot. Thank you.